Top Med Talk. Hello and welcome to Top Med Talk. We're at Euro Anesthesia 2023 here in sunny Glasgow, Scotland. <laughs> it is the annual meeting of the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. I'm Desiree Chapel, joined by my host, Monty Marthen. Hello, Monty. Hi, Desiree. Always great to be here. It is great to be here. Like we said, on and on. It is buzzing here in the exhibit hall. Lots of friendly, familiar faces, lots of new faces, lots of awesome conversation happening, I think. Yeah, I mean, you can probably hear a lot of the chatter in the background. Yeah. There's just been a, a break has happened, so there's yeah. uh, lots and lots of activity around us. As I've said, I'm sorry if I keep repeating myself, the busiest uh, yeah. trade exhibition I've busy. been in for a very, very long time. So yeah. well done to the uh, organizers of your anesthesia 23 yeah yeah so uh, for you for everyone listening today we are live and uh, if you don't know about top med talk top med talk is a global perioperative medicine podcast we focus on anesthesia and intensive care critical care but we we talk about all types of of um, information uh in healthcare. monty tell us a little bit more about top med talk so Top Med Talk was, is, we talk about it as the broadcasting arm of evidence-based perioperative medicine. So evidence-based perioperative medicine was started over 25 years ago uh, by a group of enthusiasts, and I was one of those early enthusiasts, to say that perioperative medicine was being discussed as a sort of new thing, mm-hmm. although it had been around for longer than that, you know, the sort of concept of the total care of patients from the moment of contemplation of surgery to full recovery. And it manifests itself in typical you know, meetings like this, not as big and as grand as this, but gatherings of hundreds of people. And then, then we realized that we were actually having relatively small conversations mm-hmm. in, in amongst a relatively small community of people. So prompted by the inability of me to be able to travel to a meeting in the USA in 2017, we had went followed through with an ambition that we'd had, which was to broadcast yeah. our um, what we were trying to do. And rather than video recording and video broadcasting, which it seemed as though many of those videos were never clicked on that you find on YouTube, yeah. we talked to the community that we're trying to communicate with, and they said, well, why don't you radio broadcast and then secondarily podcast? Mm. Because podcasts are much more user-friendly from the point of view of listening to them on your commute to work, you know, saving them up, deciding when you want to fall asleep, listening to them. <laughs> uh, allegedly, even some people, when they've got somebody in the anesthesia room with them covering the patient, that they might step back for a moment and listen to a, a <laughs> podcast. And here we are a number of years later with um, just shy of 2,000 podcasts we've yep. recorded between yeah. us. And uh, just on the fringe of 2 million downloads, we might have gone over actually now, 2 yeah, million downloads in over 100 countries. So that's the the... the not very executive summary of top, <laughs> top, top, top mid tool. Yeah, it's, it's a, it is high, a little bit higher level. Um, Monty, we really strive to get education out there to yeah. the masses, get it out in under-resourced countries as well. So it's free open access medical education, which is what we decided right from the get-go. So many of the meetings are uh, physically and financially I- inaccessible to yeah. the vast majority of the world. So we wanted to say if these these conversations are worth having they're worth sharing yeah now to make it free open access medical education not only does pretty much everyone involved every voice that's involved give their time for free yeah to do these things as part of our academic mission as we call it or just because we think we've got a story to share we do need some money because we do have some costs we have to keep the lights on we have to pay some people to help us do the great work to to get it out there equipment etc so that's where our sponsors come in yeah and we've had a a raft of different kinds of sponsors different colleges societies associations individual donors but mainly it's been industry partners yeah who've given us uh sponsorship unrestricted grants on a rolling basis and we find ourselves today on the edwards life sciences booth in the exhibition area yeah they were our original sponsor in 2017 they were brave enough to give us the first grant to take the to hold hands and jump off the cliff with us yeah to say well let's give this a go and they've continued to support us very generously ever since along with a whole raft we're looking across at medtronic we're looking across at g who all sponsor us as well to enable the free open access medical education and there there are no strings attached no no we we really could not do it without them so we we are very thankful for that we're thankful for our listeners we have listeners from all over the globe and you you know make this 
something for you know for us, and it's really important. It's great, and they stay. They communicate with us, which yeah. is great via Twitter and social media. We yeah. have conversations with them. Mm. They don't, don't always like what we say, no, <laughs> or, what, or what our guests say. Yeah, and, and that's they're, okay. They're prepared to call us out about that because, yeah. you know, we don't always get it right. We're, no. But we really do try and keep very high quality, keep it at a, a, a level. You've been an editor of, of journals before. and Yeah, we, we regard it as a peer-reviewed podcast. Yeah. Now, some of that peer review is on the hoof. Yeah. But we hope we stop people going over the boundaries that are set by peer-reviewed journals. Right. It's uh, like, for example, we just said Edwards Life Sciences, because that's where we are and that's what we're doing. Yes. If you should mean. But but the typical boundaries are what represent conflicts of interest. Yes. We would expect those all to be uh, accessible and available and made aware to people. Yeah. So that's important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Monty, we've had lots of voices on Top Med Talk over the years. This year at, at uh, Euro Anesthesia 2023, we have a new voice. We introduced him yesterday, Andy Cumsey. Andy, it's wonderful to have you here. Thanks for having me, Desiree. It's great to be here. Yeah. yeah. So, um, in true Top Med Talk fashion, like most people were saying, "Hey, come down and sit with, sit and have a conversation with us." We did the same with you. <laughs> yeah, we've had some fascinating right conversations down and already, and have a chat. Yeah, yeah, brilliant conversations the last two days. Really interesting. I've learned lots, and um, yeah. hopefully, it's useful for people listening too. Yeah, it's been great. Definitely. So, well, Andy, you know, you've been participating in these conversations. We thank you for the help, <laughs> first of all, and, and adding yeah. your voice and your knowledge and, and questions. Um, but you've done a lot uh, on your own, and we've talked a, touched a little bit on it over the last couple of days, but we thought we'd take some time and kind of have a, a deeper dive on some of the work that you've done and that you will continue to do. So um, the first, I guess, to take it back just a little bit, for those who may not know you, tell us a little bit more about yourself once again. Sure. Yes, I'm Andy Cumpsty. I'm currently working as an NHR-funded clinical lecturer at the University of Southampton. So that means I spend 50% of my time working clinically in University Hospital Southampton in both anaesthesia and intensive care medicine and the other half of my time working on academic research activities such as this but also PhD students, supervision, um, junior fellows and research trials. Yeah and you work down there in Southampton with Mike Grocott so with Professor Mike Grocott we want to give a big shout out to Mike who can't be here with us this weekend uh, and our team. Um, Andy tell us a little bit about some of your research interests that you have. So my main research interest has always been kind of oxygen physiology, oxygen therapy, uh, and the use of that both in general anesthesia, major surgery in a perioperative context, but also in the critical care environment in critically ill patients. And uh, that follows on from work that Monty and I and Mike started a number of years ago now on the mountains, and we're gradually translating that more into clinical trials now for our patients yeah now when you say mountains i you know that means different things to different people (laughs) in the u.s we may have some hills uh but you guys actually go way back uh and and part of the reason why topman talk is here today uh uh for the work that you guys did in everest right so that's where you had met well that's where the story starts really with i mean let's pivot it off professor mike grocott at the time a young fellow along with some other enthusiasts who had this ambition to try and take an arterial blood gas from the summit of Mount Everest. <laughs> Was that, know, is that really how it all started? That's really how it all started. So, you know, why, why wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, um, they happened to be working with me at the time. So I was this sort of um, the senior person in the department. They come and talk to me about this ambition. And, I, and the conversation would go along the lines of, well, you know, I, that sounds great. You know, but can't you do that in a chamber? And it's going to be difficult to get this one past the ethics committee. You know, <laughs> you know, rich doctors, rich kids go and try and kill themselves on Mount Everest to do something that doesn't really need doing, possibly. <laughs> and uh, to cut a long story short, because we've got lots of great series on top. Yes, talk about we do about Everest, Everest. And there are documentaries online you can find and films about it over the decades eventually came up collectively with the idea that um, we really need to do a proper experiment at, at high altitude. Yeah. Something that, you'll have to trust me, you can't do in a chamber <laughs> uh, because it takes a long period of time to acclimatize. And we said, let's do a properly designed study to address a fundamentally important question about human tolerance of hypoxia. And if we have to take 200 people from the ages of you know, 7 to 70 to answer that question, that's what we'll do. And um, that's what we did. Yeah. In 2007, the first extreme Everest expedition took 200 people to Everest Base Camp. 
um, talked about this often before, as a sidearm of that, the summit team led by uh, Professor Mike Grocott and colleagues made it to the summit of Mount Everest and just below the summit for safety reasons took arterial blood gas samples yeah. and demonstrated how extraordinarily low yeah. the level of oxygen is that people not breathing supplementary oxygen can tolerate while being awake and uh, reasonably alert yeah. and conscious. Yeah. And Andy, roughly how low were those gases? Uh, so uh, in terms of kilopascals, yeah. between two and three kilopascals. Yeah. Uh, compared to, you know, we're sitting here now, 12 to 13 kilopascals. So really low. Yeah. And if we translate yeah. it to millimetres of mercury, yeah. that's about uh, 15 to 20 yeah. odd. Min- so, you know, levels that you would think were well below, Whoa. you'd be pushing the cardiac yeah. arrest button and people... Yeah. Our mindset is people should not be alive, well, alive. at that mm. level of PaO2. And then, again, cutting a long story short, the mitochondria, which are the little fuel cells, yeah. we think only need about a kilopascal. Ah. You know, so Andy will come back to that in a second. Mm. And possibly a, the mitochondria came from a particular type of bacteria that wanted to go and hide inside our cells <laughs> uh-huh. when the oxygen levels were rising to what are currently toxic levels uh-huh. poss- we'll come back to that in a second as well of oxygen which is way beyond our need and we've adapted to cope with unnecessarily high levels of oxygen the final thing i'll say before i be quiet and let andy talk about his research <laughs> and people say well that can't be true that can't be true so we said well if you look back through the literature there's this everest in utero description oh, yeah so in other words if it's all possible what happens in the womb baby in the womb uh-huh. is feeding off the scraps of oxygen that's left over from mum yeah so it can't be as much as mum's getting it must be much less than mum's getting and actually the sort of watershed for successful intrauterine growth mm-hmm. compared to intrauterine retarded growth is almost exactly the same number that they found when they took the arterial blood gas wow on Everest. now the cool bit about that is that that means that we've all been to the summit of Mount Everest without <laughs> supplementary oxygen, which means we should all be able to go back. Yeah, but and that's we, not the case. Well, for discussion, Andy, well, go at it. Go at it. That's an interesting question, isn't it? I think, it, yeah. we've, as Monty says, we've all been there, so we probably can all go back. I guess the question is the rate at which we climb to that oh. height. So um, in the mountain environment... Uh, we talk about this acclimatization to hypoxia yeah. and some people and Professor Mike Grocott is a good example of this he's very very capable of performing very well at high altitude with a very short acclimatization period but other people will take longer than that to get the same performance and we don't fully understand yet those mechanisms but we're really keen to learn about those mechanisms because if we can induce those in patients in the hospital who let's be honest sometimes don't have very long to yeah. cope with a sudden change in their levels at all and haven't got time for those processes to kind of start and take take effect of their own accord, then potentially that could be a really powerful treatment for our patients. Yeah, that well, that was going to be one of my questions, and it may be for further on down uh, the line here. But is what can what from what you have learned so far? What does that mean to me as a clinician taking care of a patient at the bedside? So perhaps slightly paradoxically, the first thing to look at this might be rather than looking at the low levels of oxygen. We'll think about it in the other way and look at high levels of oxygen. Right. Because, as we've said on the mountains, we've shown people can survive with extremely low levels of oxygen. Yet, in medicine, right from our medical school days onwards, we're taught to give people lots of oxygen. Yes. And there's clearly good reasons for that. I think um, we've already said if you, if you have an acute medical emergency of whatever that may be in the OR, in the you know, recess room, wherever... The first thing is absolutely give the patient oxygen. That's not what we're saying here. Don't don't not put the oxygen on. But then think about how long you need to put it on for and also how much you should be giving because historically and evolutionary speaking, that patient is more used to dealing with less oxygen than too much. And then that's kind of quite a recent a new idea, I guess. And uh, particularly outside anesthesia, there's been a, a huge number of publications over kind of the last five, 10 years looking at excess oxygen not yes. um not just high levels of oxygen but unnecessary high levels of oxygen administration yeah. in patients with different clinical problems and pretty much universally all those studies have shown 
more adverse outcomes or more harm in those patients given that oxygen unnecessarily. Well, and Monty, before you jump in, like what what kind of levels are we talking about? Because, you know, I mean, we are in the OR where we have you yeah. know, oxygen that we're get, administering there. We are in, on the floor. We have different methods of administering oxygen. Like what, when you say too much oxygen, too little oxygen, where, yeah. like what kind of levels are we talking about? So uh, outside the OR, a good example might be, um, so there's been a recent change in practice in cardiology where we're, I was at medical school. I was taught every patient that comes in with an ST elevation MI or a, a heart attack. The first treatment you give them is you put them on a high flow mm -hmm. oxygen mask. You give them 15 liters of oxygen. Uh, there was a study published from Australasia in 2016 called the AVOID trial that looked at uh, that patient group and whether they should be given air or high flow oxygen if they had normal SATs, so mm -hmm. SpO2 above 94%. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the interesting finding was the patients that were given the high flow oxygen had a higher recurrence of um, a second infarct. They had larger infarct sizes in the first infarct. And they also had a higher recurrent rate of um, uh, abnormal arrhythmias. Wow. So they did worse. Yeah. Uh, there's been a number of other kind of publications in the cardiology arena looking at that and uh, exploring the mechanism of how that may occur. And we think it might be related to coronary vasoconstriction for one mm -hmm. thing and increased systemic vascular resistance because oxygen has a vasoconstriction effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and a long story short, that's led to a change in practice in cardiology. And now the latest guidelines would advocate not to give high flow oxygen okay. unless the patient has got saturations less than 94% on presentation. Interesting. And then wh what about an anesthesia um, when someone's or on a ventilator? Exactly. So that's a great question. Yeah. And I, I think if anything, we're probably a bit behind the curve in anesthesia. Yeah. So I, I kind of fell into this as a, a junior anesthetics trainee when I was going from one theater to the next theater <laughs> throughout the week. And every attending or consultant I was, I was with was giving a different amount of yeah. oxygen to their patients. So I went away and looked at what I should be giving to these patients. What do the guidelines say? And I was a bit surprised, actually, that the only guideline I could find was a, a recommendation from the World Health Organization right. that was published in 2016 as part of a, a very big document um, looking at all different ways of reducing wound infections, so surgical site infections. And it looked at how surgical instruments should be sterilized, how the skin should be prepared, a whole host of factors. But one of those factors was the oxygen. Yeah, the and percentage of oxygen that's exactly. delivered. So they recommended giving every patient 80, 80% of yeah. oxygen. So four times what we're breathing in now. Mm -hmm. And um, that was published just a couple of months after the Cochrane Collaboration had published a systematic review looking at the same evidence base for the oxygen. And they concluded in their systematic review that giving more than 60%, more than 6-0, could possibly increase mortality. And those two documents were published within a few months of each other. So we've got this interesting controversy now that we're left with in anesthesia where we've got some recommendations say give the patient lots. It may improve wound infections. And other recommendations say don't give the patient very much. It yeah. may increase mortality if you do. Wow. And so then your research now is focused on what exactly? So looking at that like question, I guess. Yeah. So um, following on from that, we went away and looked at what as any anesthetist we do give patients yep. and uh, so I co-led a study in the UK which has since been replicated in Australia and also there's some data from America that interestingly has all shown exactly the same results and it seems that most anesthetists if we had to put a number on it and practice varies widely but if we had to put a number on it the average is probably about 50-55% that's administered in the OR. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting I would say it, it there's has to be huge variation. There's massive that. variation in that and all yeah. the studies have shown that but yeah. if you have to if you have to put a, a median number on it, that's yeah. the number that comes out. And it's I think reason, we cannot have any degree of confidence that uh, oxygen is benign. Right. If you put it that way. That's yeah. not to say that we have confidence that oxygen is toxic. <laughs> it is toxic in certain circumstances, in certain models, in certain. But but on the basis of the fact we don't know mm, that absolutely. it's safe, we don't know that it's not toxic we probably should crank it back and aim for normoxia. Is that fair? Before, yeah, I think... Um, hypoxia or hyperoxia? But normoxia seems like a reasonable place to be at the moment yeah. while the questions are being answered. And I think the other thing to say is there's increasing evidence even in the last 6, 12 months that both in anaesthesia but also in critical care medicine our patients respond differently to oxygen. Mm. So what might be the right amount for one patient may not be the right amount for a second patient. Um, there was a, an interesting study published in the BJ Open a few months ago looking at patients given uh, 15 litres of oxygen for five minutes as kind of pre-oxygenation in the rhesus room ahead of some sedation for a procedure. Uh, and 
I think it was you know, a small study, 60 patients, something like that. 25% of those patients dropped their cardiac output more than 10%. And there was no way of knowing which of those patients were going to drop their cardiac right. output. If you looked at other classical factors, you might look at you know, gender, age, comorbidities. There was no way of predicting who was going to drop their cardiac output. Wow, that's interesting. So, if Andy, your recent results, before I segue into something that's related mm. to it... Uh, Good. Tell us about your recent studies and your results. So following up with that work, we've again with Professor Mike Rocott and the team in Southampton, we've been looking at what the right amount of oxygen is to give, but also what the markers of toxicity might be that we could use to try and target this better. And we think that one of the most likely candidates is markers of oxidative stress. And again, that follows on from some of the work we did at Altri with the mitochondrial studies you mentioned, but hasn't really been looked at in anesthesia before. Mm. So uh, we just recently finished a study in Southampton called Pulse Ox, which I'm currently writing up uh, publications part of my PhD. And we randomized patients having long operations, so major procedures that were a median eight, nine, ten hours long, to either 30% oxygen as per the Cochrane collaboration we talked about, 80% oxygen as per the World Health Organization's recommendation, or 50, 55% as per what most anesthetists tend to be doing at the moment. And we randomized those patients for the duration of their operation, and then measured oxidative stress markers throughout the surgery. And uh, we saw, firstly, surgery itself increases oxidative stress in all these patients, but the rate of increase depended on the amount of oxygen those patients were given. And there was a significant increase in the higher oxygen groups in a dose-dependent way, particularly in nitrosative stress. And can we be reasonably confident that having a lot of oxidative stress is bad for you or is it part of the inflammatory process that can be protective protective and lead to healing for example that's an excellent question and i think the, sh the short answer is we don't know for certain right. but there's a number of um, other diseases which are definitely uh, driven by oxidative stress pathways and we've classically always talked about oxidative stress as having pretty negative connotations from our patients so we definitely think need a degree of oxidative stress for the inflammation you talked about and that's where this whole oxygen story came from the initial hypothesis was if we give patients 80 percent oxygen we fuel this neutrophil oxidative burst we fuel um bacterial killing and we would therefore reduce wound infections and maybe that is part of the story or the more recent sorry the most recent larger trials haven't been able to replicate that early data but that doesn't necessarily look at the other outcomes that this inflammation may be associated with whether that's pulmonary inflammation um delirium post-cognitive dysfunction um potentially even mortality. I want to segue, if I could, to reminding ourselves about what hypoxia is, mm. which is a term that um, is commonly confused with hypoxemia. Absolutely. So to remind ourselves, hypoxemia is a low level of oxygen in, in the, the blood, blood. Yep. whereas hypoxia is an inadequate amount of oxygen to maintain aerobic metabolism in all of our cells yeah at the cellular level exactly. exactly yeah so therefore to get the oxygen to the cells to the mitochondria to do all the good stuff it does and we've touched on at the beginning that you may only need about a kilopascal mm. of oxygen yeah to get those energy cells to work we have to breathe it in we have to get it from the lungs into the bloodstream we have to load it up onto the hemoglobin so we need enough hemoglobin that gives us our oxygen content then we need to push it around the body, which is our cardiac output. And then when it, hopefully we've got an adequate blood volume so it gets to every cell or near every cell, then diffuses into the cells and the cells have to work. The batteries or the furnaces, whichever one will look at it, have to work. Yet we seem to be very focused in the operating room on one component of that, or possibly two components of that. How much oxygen we're putting into the lungs and how much of it ends up in the bloodstream as a percentage, which doesn't tell us about the quantity, the content, because we don't know the hemoglobin. And we don't know, in many cases, the cardiac output. Yep. Right. So I know that's a long speech from me. But how, <laughs> how, how was it that the guys who summited Everest, who had a PAO2 of, Dan Martin was the lowest, let's yep. say, about 2. Yeah, 2.5 was Dan's, yeah. yeah. That's a so about, let's call it about 20 millimetres of mercury. Yeah. How was he alive with such a low PaO2? And then yeah. we can expect a very low oxygen saturation. saturation. Yeah. So we, as you summarised very nicely, in the OR we talk very much about DO2 oxygen delivery, but yeah. particularly in critical care it's the same, isn't it? All our 
all our treatments, all our therapies are about increasing DO2. We put people on a ventilator, we give them a high percentage of oxygen, increasing their ventilation. We give them a blood transfusion to increase their hemoglobin. We give them adrenaline or noradrenaline to increase their cardiac output. And then we expect the cells to kind of do the rest. And what we've seen at altitude is actually there's a second half to that story. And as well as how the body delivers oxygen to the tissues, the body also adapts how those tissues then use the oxygen that's arriving there. So I guess another way of thinking about this is putting fuel in your car and getting 45 miles per gallon out of it. But then somehow the engine becomes more efficient and fine-tunes itself. And the same fuel is going into the tank, but suddenly it's running at 65 miles per gallon. And obviously that car goes a lot further on the same tank. So somehow at altitude, the body is adapting to utilize the oxygen more efficiently, even though the oxygen it's getting, well, actually, that's some other data from my Grocott study is that the content is not changed at lower altitudes. We can talk about that separately in a second. But um, this utilization is a really interesting concept, which we haven't really, well, we've barely scratched the surface of at all in terms of clinical practice. And all our treatments are currently about delivering more oxygen. And I think we should look at, as we say, the microcirculatory components, the Micro, um, mitochondrial components and really how the cells are using that oxygen that gets to them. So, so let's take that very practical message to the bedside. Let's go into the yeah. operating room first. Yeah. I think what we need to remind ourselves of is if we're using mechanical ventilation, for example, yeah. that is more likely than not to be upsetting the heart rather than helping the heart. Absolutely, yeah. So then we add some PEEP because yep. we think that's a good idea for atelectasis, and that's upsetting the heart a little bit more, possibly. Yeah. And then the patient starts to get a drop in saturation, and maybe we turn up the FiO2 uh, to get the saturation up, or maybe we turn up the ventilator and do other things with it. We might actually be making the DO2 go down. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's not something we think about. But interesting, we, we saw that in pulse ox. So the trial I mentioned, my PhD study at Southampton, randomizing the 30, 55, 80%. We saw a significant decrease in tissue oxygen extraction in a dose-dependent way as the oxygen increased. So you increase the FiO2 to your patient, but the tissue extraction drops. So you're actually give, get the patient is extracting less, even though they're being, given. on the face of it, given more. And in COVID, we saw the the COVID pandemic. We saw the extreme yes. examples of this yeah. in a critical care environment. We, you know, we're now trying to work with staff who may have worked in the operating yeah. room mm-hmm. and had relatively little experience of complex critical care patients. They're coming in and they're extremely hypoxemic. Yeah. They appear to have not very stiff lungs when we intubate them and ventilate them. But everyone's trying really hard to get the PaO2 up, the oxygen tension up in the blood, yeah. and get the oxygen saturation up on the pulse oximeter. And they're ventilating the lungs harder and harder. Which is yeah. And what eventually when we get a chance to step in and measure cardiac output or get yeah. our echo probe out, they're inducing right heart failure. Yeah. yeah. And actually the patient is dying from yeah. our efforts to get the oxygen levels yeah. up, which is effectively strangling the oxygen delivery. Yeah, I, I saw that definitely in my practice during the COVID pandemic. And um, it's a difficult thing to prevent happening because on the face of it, we've not got many um, immediate bedside points of care test markers that can yeah. really show that process straight away even you know pulse oximeters they're very good at measuring hypoxemia but they won't tell you about hyperoxemia and they don't tell you about anything at the cellular level it yeah. stops at the blood we don't know what the cells are doing there so your original question Desiree was that any takeaway from the extreme yeah. Everest research if you, if you take all the observations that are bedside and many critical care experienced critical care practitioners and critical care nurses respiratory techs have known this for a very long time. Mm-hmm. You can tolerate a lower oxygen saturation if you think you've got a... Everything tells you you've got a reasonable oxygen delivery. Yes. So you've got a warm... The sat's maybe 88%, for mm. example. Yeah. But the patient's warm, well perfused. Yeah. They're passing urine. They don't have an acidosis. Their lactate level is one. They're being enterally fed, and mm-hmm. the enteral feed into their stomach is disappearing. Yeah suggesting the fact that's a, a yeah, very good indicator absolutely. of the fact the body is working, working. Mm-hmm. that there's nothing at all to suggest that that 88 percent is not okay if you want to then you can put a you can cerebral put a, a cerebral oximeter yeah. probe to reassure yeah. yourself and lo and behold you'll probably find that the cerebral oxygen saturations are higher than you'd expected mm. because of a lower brain utilization mm-hmm. of the oxygen because of the blunting effects of global 
inflammation. You would have experienced that, Desiree, as a, as a critical care nurse. Yeah, absolutely. And I, it, it, it's so interesting. I haven't really taken time to reflect back in, on this conversation that we had a lot during COVID yeah. about what, you know, what we're doing the right thing. And I think a, so many of us feel like we have to intervene. We have to do something, crank up the oxygen, crank up the, the ventilator. And it does kind of take you back to those times where you're like, no, you know, let's rationally think about how we would be treating somebody who doesn't have COVID and what we would be doing. And yeah. so, it, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I, I get this conversation a lot because we do talk about, we've talked about Everest. We've talked about, um, there's been lectures that we've heard on, on oxygenation and oxygen and how does that really translate in what we're doing? I think this is a great conversation to, to really highlight what we can think about at the bedside. I think that, I guess the, the kind of take home from this is a lot of the treatments we're starting on patients are not Enough. physiological. So, yeah. I mean, we didn't, as we talked about evolutionary terms, we didn't grow up with lots of oxygen around us. Yeah. And the same way with ventilation, you know, ventilation, as we do it with yeah. most often with positive pressure devices, blowing air into the lungs, that's not the way we evolve. That's not, that's not physiological at all, really. Yeah. So two interesting developments there. Hmm. There's the, the high flow oxygen, the OptiFlow type mm. of yes. technology, which is blowing, in the first instance, high concentration mm. oxygen into the airways to produce a positive pressure effect, but in an open system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Comes in different guises. Yeah. Very interesting literature that says if you do the same high flows with air mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. oxygen, you get the same or near same benefits, implying the fact it's a mechanical yeah. issue helping breathing. Is that fair, Andy? So yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think I've, I mean, there's, there's an exponential increase in papers looking at high flow nasal oxygen in the last kind of couple of years, but very few of them have shown it's better than other alternatives that yeah. I'm aware of. And, and the mechanical effect in, there's one trial from sub-Saharan Africa right, comparing is... high-flow oxygen to high-flow air to et cetera, et cetera. One of the neat findings in it that seems hidden in the paper is the high-flow air seemed to produce a much, if yeah. not more benefit. Than so the, the high-flow was good. The yes. flow. Yeah. yeah. The flow was good, and but it wasn't necessarily humidified. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let's park that one for a second. Let's go right back to the beginning of or what we think is the beginning of critical care. The Ibsen lecture was on yesterday. Yes, the, yeah. The, the, uh, the polio pandemic yes. and those acres of iron lungs. When we started ventilating people, negative pressure ventilation with the head sticking out of the box yeah. to enable a conscious person to breathe more easily and to be able to fed and to feed and drink was the right way to do things. Yeah. Why, why did we end up sticking the tubes in <laughs> and doing the positive pressure way, Andy? Is that that's a really good question, isn't it? And again, so I've grown through a training scheme where that's sort of all I've seen. Every patient's been positive pressure ventilated. Yeah, but, when, but when you look back, I mean, it's difficult to find any study, and we've looked at this recently for a reason we'll probably come on to in a second, but it's difficult to find any study out there that says, that says positive pressure gives you a better outcome than negative pressure. Mm -hmm. it, it's perhaps easier from a nursing point of view in terms of access to the patient. And uh, from a technology point of view, there's a, a change in um, production techniques around the kind of 50s, 60s that allowed positive pressure ventilators to be able to be produced more cheaply and more efficiently. But it's difficult to find an outcome benefit in positive pressure when you look at the studies. Well, I mean, you can't stick a tube in and negatively no. ventilate somebody. So, and but if you, you have someone be, sedated... Does, you can, but it doesn't last long. Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I mean, if you have someone sedated under anesthesia, I mean, isn't that... Why yeah, we're why uh, there's we're that component of it, but I, I think the reason we went fairly rapidly to intubating and positive care. pressure ventilating yeah. people was a, a much smaller real estate because yeah. you, know, you just yeah. you get the tube in successfully and you've got a medical student with a bag and they're squeezing it, yeah. which is what happened next. Yeah. yeah, you can then form a tracheostomy and yeah. you get into this world of positive pressure is easier, which yeah. is what, what it is. It's a lot of what but, we've done, <laughs> but, but the very high price to pay for yeah. it is the sedation the harm of positive yeah. pressure, the heart-lung interactions. Right. Breathing is very complicated. The interaction between the heart and the lung is very complicated. And in the interest of time, we'll jump straight in to say Andy and others have been working on a, a reintroduction of the iron lung and negative pressure ventilation. Yeah. Are you so, going to roll a big, a big iron lung in here? Well, I, I really can't take the credit for this. This has uh, <laughs> this, this come out of, uh, again, after the COVID pandemic, there was a team of... Uh, very experienced engineers and scientists from around the UK, but very quickly internationally, who looked at this and basically said, why aren't we doing more of this? And, you know, there was a, a time where ventilators were extremely short and there was a, a ventilator call for new 
new technologies to design new ventilators. Yeah. And the engineers uh, basically managed to make one of these devices uh, in, oh, their, yeah. in their garages. Oh, I've never seen that. Yeah. I'm just so showing a video is, in my phone of me being in the negative ventilator. I've been in this device You've as well, the Exxon too. device, yeah. So it's a f- fantastic group of very enthusiastic and very knowledgeable people who have literally been able to build some of these devices in their garage out of minimal components, minimal equipment required, but very efficient, effective ventilation d- devices. Um, when I went in it and I came out of it at the other end and they turned the machine off, it was so effective I initially forgot to breathe. I didn't realise I needed to do it, which is quite an alarming feeling. Yeah. Oh, was, that's interesting. The, the yeah. big, we'll see if we can get a picture associated with it and yeah. get the link in the show notes. I mean, the big obvious difference is the materials have improved. Absolutely. Ah, yeah. so, much so. so the a- aerospace have helped yeah. with the development. Yeah. The sensors have improved. The materials that allow you to make seals around your yeah. neck and your legs. If you think of sailing dry suits, for example. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. It's, it, everything's kind of leapt forward with the ability to do it quickly. I think they've even developed one that you can walk around in or drive they in. They have, yeah. yeah. So there's... Um, no kidding. There's a whole host of these that they've been working on as a, as a group. Oh. But um, it's really interesting to kind of watch, even in a you know, couple of years, short period of time, the rapid progression of the prototypes yeah. and the, the way the technology is rapidly changing around us. But I think it's going to be something to watch in the future soon. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. And, and when, you're, when you're in it, you can, you can eat, you can drink, you Absolutely. can speak. Absolutely, you can talk, yeah. So, so patience... All the, all the people we put in it have felt very comfortable in it and we've not done any patient trials yet we've been working with the team trying to look at how we get those trials moving but yeah. we've had a number of healthy volunteers in the in the machine and yeah. every one of them comes out with very good feedback they don't feel uncomfortable they don't feel the stress they're talking sipping water through straws eating if they want um, wow. but actually being very effectively ventilated and that brings us back to in Getting the amount of ventilation required right, it's going yeah. to be easier from one extent because the patient's conscious. Yes. So they so can. you can have symptomatic yeah. ventilation. Yeah. But also mixed in with that, there's an opportunity using the modern technology to relatively non-invasively measure cardiac output yeah. and pulse mm. oximetry to have DO2 guided yeah. ventilation, mm. which you can do with positive pressure ventilation, yeah. but here to very specifically have you know, servo-controlled DO2 driven ventilation yeah. to do the minimal amount of ventilation required to maintain an adequate oxygen delivery. And for one of the first times to be able to really separate out oxygenation from ventilation when we're treating yes. patients. So we can put a patient in this negative pressure ventilator machine on two litres of oxygen or on 70 litres high flow nasal oxygen. It's a totally separate delivery pathway. Yeah. Wow. How cool is that? That is super cool. You heard it here on Top Men Talk. Yeah. Do you want to go in one? Does it? it's in? I do. It is. It's, it's in the studio. The very early prototype we saw when we're getting ready to come up here in 1010 Great West Road, yes. Howland Co. Wonderful place where we have our studio in London. Was also very generously loaned yeah. by Martin Howe and colleagues to be used as a test bed to, for the development of the negative pressure ventilator. So when we were yeah. in there a few days ago, there was a wooden yeah, box, saw- the early prototype made out of wood, yeah. Yeah, which is great. And it works fine. And the, the team are here at Euro Anesthesia presenting in very shortly, very actually, shortly. half past 11 today. Oh, yeah. 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 We'll yeah. head over to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's great. Andy, I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad that you're helping us out on Top of Tech, but I'm glad we had this conversation. This is great. Thanks for having me. It's been yeah. really, really great fun. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, um, on that note, you know, you can listen to all the conversations that we had here at, at Euro Anesthesia 2023 at topmedtalk.com. Yeah, Monty. And the Exovent, where, yeah. where do they find it? How's it oh, spelled? Yeah. So E-X-O-V-E-N-T. And they have their own website, which we'll put a link to in the in the in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. And Extreme Everest yeah. is extreme spelt without the E. So yeah. it's X. Is that going to happen again? Of course it's going to happen. It's happening the whole time. Well, 2027 20, will be the 20th anniversary. Yeah. I keep saying to Professor Mike Brokaw. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Yeah, you heard it here first. It too. And you heard it here first. Andy's going to lead it. I was going to say, you're a, cli- you're a climber. <laughs> I, I, I'll I go climbed. with you. Yeah. yeah, great. Let's do it. That's right. Let's do it. <laughs> My kids want to go again. They were yeah. they've been twice. They're babies. They've grown up now. They want to go and do the full thing. Yeah, count so us e- in. Extreme Everest with an X, and there you'll find links to all the papers and videos and documentaries about the whole endeavour. And you and it, on Top Med Talk, yes. If you look up Extreme yeah. Everest and Hypoxia, we've done a whole mini series yes. about the whole thing, which is great. And that's all I've got to say for now. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for listening to Top Men Talk. We do uh, we do appreciate you so much for the time that you take to listen to our podcast. It's so important. And thank you to our sponsors. We couldn't do without you. Edwards Life Sciences today here at Euro Anesthesia, GE Healthcare, Medtronic. You all make it happen. So thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.